with our uh, two accounting people uh, and uh, we were a little behind to start but uh, finished up uh, almost in record time I'm thinking but uh, that'll be up to Matt to say but uh, it was uh, again a very professionally done audit and I appreciate Matt's staff and, and uh, my uh, staff as well. Thanks Mike, uh, members of the board, thank you for the invitation to present tonight. Uh, you receive four documents which are the official final product of the audit. I'm not going to page through that with you tonight. You receive a copy of the PowerPoint as well, and uh, for members of the audience, there's a copy over there as well. I want to take about 10 minutes or so just to give you the results of our audit and as well as some financial analysis for the most uh, recent fiscal year, end of June 30th, 2014. This year, as in years past, we provided an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, and that's our real goal as auditors. It's Mike and his team's responsibility to prepare financial statements at the district. It's our job to uh, come in, test, examine, give an opinion on those financial statements so that users of them can be assured of their accuracy. We do that through the independent auditor's report in front of the statements, and the unmodified opinion is the best we can give. So the numbers we're gonna be looking at tonight are materially accurate, a true picture of the district's financial position at the end of the last school. We also performed a couple of compliance audits. The feds require us to take a look at where your federal dollars are being spent to make sure that they're in compliance with those grants. This year we tested the child nutrition program and the special education program and happy to report no findings on either of those two programs for the year. So a clean opinion on a single audit. And then uh, finally, we did a Minnesota legal compliance audit. The state requires that we test you on all the various state statutes that apply to school districts and one minor housekeeping item, a particular report that needs to get to the state was a couple of days late, but other than that, a clean up opinion when it comes to Minnesota legal compliance as well. As far as internal control goes, we had uh, three findings this year. Two you see uh, each year, that are what I call perennial findings, lack of segregation of accounting duties and preparation of financial statements. And this year we did have to make an adjustment to the numbers uh, related to state aid, as well as some debt and escrow activity to uh, get the numbers in line to ultimately give our opinion. We spent about an hour with the uh, finance team, finance committee last week, uh, going through all these numbers in detail, all the findings in detail. If you have specific questions on them, I'll be happy to uh, respond to those at the end of the presentation, but I think we gave the details of those uh, to the committee, and I think they were comfortable with where we landed on that. With my remaining time, I want to take a look at the numbers for the year, and the best way to do that is to start with the general fund budget. As a board, you set the parameters for spending, the operations for the finances here at the district through that budget process, hand it off to administration, and they execute that budget on your behalf. So any analysis of how the year went should be done under the context of that budget. And if you recall for 2014, you approved a budget that had $73.2 million in revenue, $72 million of spending, and a small surplus of about $1 million at the end of the year. Actual results for the year, revenue came in a little bit less than anticipated, at 72 million, which is about a million dollars under budget, it's about a one and a half percent variance. Most of that in state aids, general education aids, the uh, projections regarding the enrollment came a little bit shy of your original projections. 
The general fund expenditures uh, for the year were $74.1 million, it's about $2.1 million over budget, or about a 2.8% variance. Regular instruction costs for personnel coming on board during the year, as well as some facility costs with the uh, winter last year, the utilities associated with that, drove some variances for you during the year there as well. So the fund balance ultimately did decline about $2 million to about $10.4 million at the end of the year. One thing I do want to mention regarding the budget, it was the original budget that you set and did not amend during the year. So there are going to be swings throughout the year when it comes to that, and that's something to consider as a board, depending on how significantly your operations change during the year, some of the projections or some of the needs that the district has, you may want to revisit that, amend the budget so everybody's on the same page. But based on an original budget, when you see variances in that 1% or 2% range, considering that budget was done 18 months ago before the projections for the student capital year, uh, relatively uh, on track for the year. Uh, the numbers are ultimately driven by your student count. About 90% of your revenue came from the state of Minnesota this past year, and you had about a 311 increase in your resident ADMs. These are public school students that live within the Shakopee boundaries, whether they attend here or not. It's about a 4% increase. And then the number of students that you actually serve only increased about 3% because the open enrollment losses continued to grow during the year. You're basically bringing in about the same number of non-residents, right around that 150 mark or so, but your uh, uh, residents that leave the district for other districts uh, grows a little bit each year. And as a result, while a 4% increase on your residents, only about a 3% increase on your students served. As I mentioned, revenue for the year, about 90% of it came from the state of Minnesota, about 8% was from local property tax payers, and 4% from other sources, mostly federal dollars. It's about a 5% increase from 2013 to 2014, 68.6 .6 million to 72 million in 2014. Um, back on the uh, slide one, one minute, we did have the state pay back the property tax shift, so our property tax looks lower than it was, it's just kind of, we advanced them the money back in uh, 2011, it looks like, with the 9.9, 9 .9, and then they paid it back in 2014. So that's a big swing, but next year on um, general fund, our local property tax will be up in that $8, $8 million range again. So I'm trying to find the exact amount. $3.6 million was paid yeah. back. So if you add 3.6 to the property right tax, it would be right around $9 million or so, which would be an incremental prior year and deduct 3.6 from the 2011. So basically swap those two around. So 2011, 2014 are going to be anomalies. Uh, typical ratio are going to be the 2010, 2012, 2013 years as long as the state doesn't go back to uh, the tax shift anytime soon. Matt, if we have a question, we are waiting for asking. No, jump in right away. I just want to clarify the, uh, the gray, I guess it is, which is other. I'm assuming a lot of that's federal dollars. And I'm assuming, for example, in 2010, the six million largely driven by stimulus dollars probably at that point. Yes. But it's declined to four, four, <coughs> three, three. What I'm, my question is, are we going to see a continuing decline or are we going to kind of be steady state in the threes um, without some sort of stimulus activity? Maybe it's a question for Mike. Well, I, the stimulus was yeah. just in, in 11 there. And then uh, I would, our, our biggest ones are title and uh, federal special ed. And so back at the special ed table back here. I'm not sure uh, whether that's going to keep going. It's not, it doesn't appear to be going up. So it's been staying on the revenue side. The federal revenue has been pretty, we went through uh, the ten, um, sequestration. So we lost 10%, actually more than that, quite a lot, $150,000 in funds last year. So we'd probably be in more in the $4 million range, probably. Okay. More of a steady state. Yeah. All right. And of that other number, uh, about $2 million is fed to the other 1.3. It's other local sources, everything from uh, fees for classes to admissions to the ball game. It's two thirds of that's federal. Or two thirds of it, yeah. Uh, we're often asked, how does our district compare to other districts? And it's not a, a uniform. <laughs> look as you go from district to district. So I'm always a little wary of these comparisons, but I think it also gives you some perspective on some of the disparities of funding uh, from one district to another across the state. And what I've done here is show revenue per student served for your district on top, broken up by the major categories, 
and then the seven county metro area, and then all districts statewide. And we only have comparatives for 2013, so maybe look there, and you're gonna see about a one, uh, about a $1,700 variance between a typical district who gets about $10,700 in your district, which was about $9,000 in revenue for 2013. There are three or four factors that play a big part of that. The operating referendum that your local property taxpayers pay is ultimately gonna be a piece of that. You can see it's about a $500 difference between the average district and your district. And then also state revenue plays a role in that as well. There's about a $700 disparity there. And there are varying uh, levels of state aid depending on need at your district. If you're a high free and reduced count or high poverty district, you're gonna receive an additional aid through the general education formula called compensatory aid. It's gonna add dollars to the state numbers. Also, if you're a high special education need district, you're gonna see more special education aid coming in as well. Uh, so again, uh, demographically, uh, the choices that you and your taxpayers make regarding the operating referendum are ultimately gonna drive the revenue side of it. And that ultimately is gonna drive the spending as well. And if you take a look at that, generally you're gonna spend what you bring in over time. And a, a typical a district is spending about $10,700. Your district spent about $9,200 in 2013. Again, about a $1,500 disparity. Mostly driven, uh, not necessarily by choice, but because of the revenue spending that ultimately comes into the district. If you look at where the dollars are going, uh, about 70% of it is hitting the classroom directly. If you look at regular instruction, the biggest piece of the pie, vocational at the bottom portion of the chart and special education, which are the instructional categories, 69% for 2014. Go back a year, that chart's almost identical. Actually, 70% hit the classroom in 2013. And instructional support, which is a big part of the education process, that's a 77% number for 2013, well over three quarters of the dollars hitting the inst direct instructional uh, activities here at the district. This chart does the best job of showing a five-year history. Uh, as we looked earlier, there was a deficit uh, for the year in 2014 of about $2 million, took the fund balance down from $12 million down to about $10.4 million. And then the bottom portion of this chart shows you the breakout of the fund balance from there. Uh, we have a set aside for operating capital, which are dollars that came from the state through the general education formula that are required to be spent on facilities and equipment, about $1.9 million. So those are tied up for that particular uh, uh, activity. And then there's another set aside called health and safety. And that's a negative amount and that represents a future levy authority that the district has to reimburse yourself for health and safety expenditures that have occurred in the past. Basically spend that down, code the expenditures against that particular category, and then when you get the levy authority and choose to levy for it in the future, you code it back to that and make you whole ultimately there. What's left is the unassigned fund balance, and that's kind of the scorecard or the discretionary balance that you have here to work with. Uh, $9.2 million at the end of the year. You can see how that compares to the last several years. And probably a better way to look at that is a, as a percentage of spending. And the state has calculated that out for you. It's a 14.7%. And if you look at your fund balance policy, your fund balance policy is looking for about a 12% uh, level. So after everything is said and done, that unassigned amount is pretty much right in line with the fund balance policy that you as a board have established. And again, fund balance represents the financial health of the district. And that is no necessarily right or wrong answer when it comes to that. It's a policy decision as to what level of fund balance you would like to maintain your policies at 12%. Hey Matt, can you go back one slide to sure. the um, health and safety line? How far back are we allowed to levy to essentially pay ourselves back? Is there any limit? Good question. I, I don't think there is a limit. I just, I'll be checking with the state on this to see when we're going to be made whole. Sometimes when we have projects, it's kind of a timing thing on projects. You know, some projects happen, now we pay for them early and then get the money next year. Sometimes we get the money in advance and, and then have the project come due. So it, it's a bunch of timing stuff right here, I believe, and I'll be following up with the state to verify that, that, that we'll get that down to zero at some point. Down to zero, meaning not necessarily going all the way back to 2010? No, down to zero, not necessarily 700,000 in the hole. Okay. So years, the, years past, 2013 and Collectors, yeah. We, we can't collect them. We can, should be able to collect them. Because what they do is they look at the revenue over the last period of time in the levy, and that goes back for all your life, it looks like. But since 98, I think the number says on there. 
So they look at your revenues and how much you've levied. They look at your expenditures and then the difference is what you can levy. And then if we zero okay. that out, let's assume we can go back a couple of years and sure. we levy it and we zero it out, those funds then get deposited into the general unrestricted? Uh, yeah, basically it would be, would that, or is it in well, capital, where, where do you? It would ultimately grow your fund balance. I'd say if you had the levy here in 2014, uh, your fund balance would be at $11.1 .1 million. Uh, and it would zero out that negative, so your other two numbers would stay the same. But obviously, cash flow wise and you know, financial health wise, you'd be that much better off. So. I mentioned fund balance is a, a discretionary decision, a policy decision, but a couple things to keep in mind. It's there for two things it's there for cash flow. And is there to act as a shock absorber, especially when you're in kind of a high growth mode like your district is? A lot of uh, decisions need to be made. A lot of uh, variables come in each year depending on your student count. And this chart, I think, does a nice job of showing the cash flow for part of the equation. The uh, tan portion or green portion of the bar is your fund balance each of the last five years, relatively stable and flat over that time. But take a look at the dark blue portion of the bar there. That's uh, the cash balance, and that is dictated by the state as to when they decide they're gonna pay you. Uh, they had some financial challenges, obviously, in the last couple of years. The first place that they generally go, which they see as relatively painless, is to hold back dollars from school districts because they're on a cash basis at the state. If they can balance their inflows and their outflows, they consider their balance, uh, their budget balance. So the, the worst of it was in 2012. That's when they had already borrowed from you that $3.6 million in tax shift. They also were only paying the state aids out at about 64% during the school year. The other 36% came in cash after the end of the year. And you can see there's a $10 million disparity between your fund balance and your cash balance in 2012, basically representing a $10 million IOU for the state of Minnesota because they were having some financial challenges. Uh, now things have gotten much better. The tax shift has been paid back. Uh, the payout from of the state aids is at 90-10 again, 90% during the school year, 10% after year end. And you can see at the end of 2014, your cash balance is actually higher than your fund balance by about five million or so. And that represents the first property tax payment that comes in May or June when the property tax pay it. And that's gonna be used for the following school year. So you're getting some of your cash ahead of time now. Now uh, the state hasn't borrowed against that. So again, when you're making decisions regarding fund balance, consider cash flow. It is as good as it's gonna get right now. No property tax shift and a 90-10 payout. But there are going to be times down the line again when I would anticipate the state will come back and ask for their, your help when it comes to cash flow. And you're going to want to factor that in when it comes to your fund balance policy. Quick look at the food service fund. It had a very solid year. $96,000 surplus. Grew your fund balance from $327,000 at the beginning of the year to $423,000 at year end. That actually is unusual. Um, seeing districts across the state struggling in their food service fund this year. A lot of the federal mandates are causing some challenges both on the expense side and also on the meal serve side. A lot of students are not choosing to uh, pay for lunches under the new program. So I'm seeing deficits most of the places and here actually you had a very solid positive year in food service for 2014. And then community service is the final fund we'll look at tonight. And this is basically a conglomeration of a lot of activities. Your school readiness program, your ECFE program, all your community education programs are in this particular fund. And what I would do is look at the bottom portion of the graph, and that's the fund balance for each of the categories that you have. You can see all of them are positive at the end of the year, and that indicates to me that the revenue stream, the levy, the aids, the charges for services, the tuition fees that you have for this fund are covering the cost of doing business in this fund. Each of them, each of those programs are self-supporting when it comes to the end of the year. So I think a good story to tell the community service. Uh, that's what I have. I wanted to give you a very high-level overview of the results of the year and the results of our audit. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to stay and answer them. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is it better to uh, estimate your student count everything low and have a surprise gift at the end of the year? <laughs> or is it better to try to be accurate? What's I would, uh, I guess, answer your question with a question. I think uh, what I would want to know is if I knew that my numbers were better, would I change my uh, program in any way? Uh, if you have the uh, needs fulfilled of the district from you as policy says here at the board, if you feel that uh, the, the students' needs are being covered uh, and it's within that budget, um, 
then you're probably on track. If you feel that, uh, that you want to revisit that mid-year and see if there is a, a larger revenue stream coming in, uh, you can certainly do that and see if there's any places that are uh, additional need. I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. That obviously, you want to be as accurate as possible. And, uh, um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be anything wrong with having an amendment during the year, getting a report from administration on where your student count appears to lie, what that might do to the projections that you have. And then you as a board with that information can choose to do it, do something with it or not when it comes to the budget. Any other questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the audit. I'll make a motion to accept the audit. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you very much, Thank you. Matt. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you, Mike and your staff. Uh, we're going to skip a little bit more and go to uh, 6.1, which is the second meeting for increased opportunities for students with clubs and activities. Sounds good. <coughs> uh, at the last meeting, we had the, as uh, the chairman said, so we had the first reading of the various clubs that we were going to add, and there didn't seem to be much, uh, much concern. There was some questions on two of them, and we put those in the packet again. Uh, that uh, you can see some changes that were made in one of them. The first one being the Somali Club. A lot of that was just the formatting change. We changed the different formatting with the six questions, and uh, they had a couple questions they hadn't answered. We have really answered all of those now with that format change. And the other club that we had a little question on was the, uh, the Bowling Club. Uh, they had a little language that was a little, a little harsh at times, so we uh, went back to talk to them and uh, softened up some of their shells and this and that uh, to kind of fit more of our philosophy of the school district and participation and all that. And uh, they were happy to do that. That was just, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they weren't as polished in their, uh, in their writing for what they were trying to accomplish. So they were more than happy to do that. So uh, you know, we're going to bring both those forward and the other ones. And I'd like to see the board of, you know, give final blessing on those clubs at this time. And it, it works well for them to meet those parameters. Yeah. And you know, it actually gives them some guidance on how to lay things out, make some think of things that they might not normally think. <coughs> Everybody comes in with the, their good intentions, but we want to kind of point out things that could happen. That's why we sometimes make them aware of, like, I think the small group and have the decision making process and who's the final arbitrator or something as well. I think we staff them and something's going on. So it just gives people to think of things so if something does come up, we've got to. showing you in December in terms of the work around secondary and then just also talk briefly tonight about first grade. So if you, uh, as you know, we've been working um, diligently with about 10 committees around articulation regarding the secondary program. And this is all sort of early uh, results because we have one more round of meetings that will happen in November, but uh, it's already shaping up that we're going to see a lot of changes in our elective areas. Um, beginning next year in 2014-15 uh, with the new required gateway courses one 
um, from each of the six areas of interest, which we've talked about before. And then there was some discussion when I met with you last time about whether the electives, which especially in seventh grade, we really didn't have elective choice uh, before, whether we would sort of revamp the electives in seventh grade in a two-year process or in a one-year process, but as they all met here recently, they're just ready to go for it. So <laughs> it's all gonna be revamped going into next year. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little preview of what seventh and eighth is uh, shaping up to look like here in a minute. Uh, another thing that's been a lot of focus of our discussions in those groups working on the six areas of interest is how to widen um, the choice for ninth grade electives as well. Um, with those, uh, with ninth grade being physically in the two junior highs, um, there's been, it's been difficult to give them kind of the same variety of choice that is available to the 10th and 12th graders. So I've sort of challenged our, our TIP committees to think outside the box about how to do that even though we're living, uh, living with those uh, limitations of the brick and mortar right now. So there's gonna be ongoing discussions about how to do that. Some things that we've definitely committed to uh, that you'll see in proposals is offering full year world language options in seventh grade, which we were unable to do before. Uh, a new scope and sequence of courses around computer science, around biomedical, and some new courses, in, especially in science and technology. So these are all working titles, and I want to emphasize that, because they were definitely into, let's have fun with the titles. <laughs> but they are fun. <laughs> Remember, on the, you'll see here on the, the left-hand side is our areas of interest, arts and communication, engineering, and manufacturing, health sciences, human services, business, and entrepreneurship, and then science and technology. Here are some working titles of the choices that kids will be able to pick from beginning next year. Um, and so when you look at uh, those like Drop the Beat is an electronic music composition choice. A House of Style has to do with interior and fashion design. Uh, Shape Your Space and Design Your World has to do with art. Uh, they definitely are gonna change this title, but it's the placeholder. Convergence Journalism <laughs> is definitely not exciting enough. But actually what it is, what it is is actually, I love what they're thinking about doing. It's really, I mean, and uh, Crystal would be able to verify this. Really now, if you want to be in publishing or reporting, et cetera, you have to know all phases of the operation. It used to be you could just be behind the camera or just do the report, that kind of thing. It's not true anymore. That's not how it's done in the real world. So it's really, that's where the word convergence journalism comes from. It's knowing all the aspects of it. But I will guarantee you they'll have a better title by the time you see it in, in uh, December. And then obviously um, design and build, uh, architecture, all those. Uh, health sciences is an area that we really, I was excited to see some of those. Medical detectives, first responder, team chef. Uh, law and order, the kids should take that just for the name itself. And, uh, <laughs> and then innovation lab, money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, and then you can see in the science of technology, and we really had no strict like computer kind of courses at the, uh, at the middle level. So now we're looking at app, app creations, uh, computer applications, and an invisible world of technology, which is really about nano uh, technology. So that's kind of the highlight, real, uh, and again, the working titles, because they're subject to change, but uh, that's sort of what they're thinking, and this is what both seventh and eighth graders will get to choose from, and one thing I'm excited about, based on principal recommendation, um, these electives will be open both in seventh and eighth, so we will have classes that will have seventh and eighth graders together, which is another nice transition piece, because that is what it happens at the high school. So it again gets them used to more of a multi-age grouping, which is really, I think, good for high school Nancy, level. Did anyone come up with a, a coding class as a suggestion? Uh, part of app creations would be kind of like preliminary coding oh. would be part of that. Uh, they, they were afraid to say it quite that clearly because they thought it might scare some of the kids away. But definitely when you look at what I think they'll start to put into place for ninth grade and above, it'll have all of those components. There'll be more of a straight academic computer science piece. Mm -hmm. So a child starting seventh grade next year, between seventh and eighth grade, how many of these are they able to pick? 
So um, the, one of the things the principals wanted to see is that these courses would be semester offerings instead of quarter because the required gateway courses are quarter classes and they wanted the kids to go a little bit deeper into their areas of interest plus I think just a concern to make sure that kids and teachers have more time together to kind of build that relationship. <coughs> so I call them, if you are the non-band, non-choir, non-world language kid, <laughs> in seventh grade you'd be able to choose three of these, and in eighth grade you'd be able to choose five. But if you are heavily scheduled band, choir, and language, then you'll have just a, sh a very, you know, a smaller bank, because you're choosing the languages in the band and choir as you're elected. Is there a minimum of two, though, each year, even if you're in those other? So yeah, if they take full year world language, it takes out a whole year, a whole period. So, so like in seventh one. grade, yeah. if yeah. I'm a band yeah. choir, yeah. and then I want to take full year world language, that takes out a whole, yeah. There is no choice. Well, they're choosing yeah. band, yeah. choir, language. Are you talking band, both band, choir, or band, or choir? Band, or, they can take both, yeah. so it kind of depends on what they decide but those that is their three choices when they do that so that means then it's hard for them to enter that but so they, to my own clarity they have three elective options each in semester, seventh each grade okay. no 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 just three because there's semester courses in right. seventh grade they have three and in if in uh, eighth grade they have five so in seventh grade they would have two one semester and one All right, any questions about those uh, range of courses? It kind of gives you an insight to what will be shaping up at the high school as well because these are all supposed to be introing um, opportunities that would be at the high school level. First grade, I just want to talk about first grade because we made such a wonderful investment in all day K yesterday and I want you to know I haven't forgotten and that uh, we've started to meet with first grade and uh, really talk about uh, what does it mean now that this first class of all day K students are going to be coming to us next fall. So some of the things that we are looking at already and kind of committing to for our work this year is really raising end of year expectations, which we did as well in kindergarten. Uh, and anecdotally, just to kind of share, I, I saw a couple of our kindergarten teachers a, a few weeks ago we had sent them to a, a workshop that K team to kind of take a look at what the state is saying about all day K and they were telling me at this point they are about a month ahead where they would normally be um, and feeling really good about how quickly um, they're getting to know their kids A because that makes a big difference when you can be with them all day and um, really identifying kids who may, may, may need help and those kids who are moving along quickly. So they're even having some conversations about the fact that maybe even kindergarten needs to start thinking about some flex grouping because they've got math kids who are really ready to go and be in the first grade standard. So those kinds of conversations are happening, happening and we're excited about that. So, you know, first grade meeting to make sure that we're keeping our expectations high. Um, adding STEM labs, which we did in kindergarten, world technology integration, they'd like to continue what kindergarten um, has started. Uh, stronger fo focus on science instruction when uh, the commissioner was here to see Ann uh, Rutter at Jackson she talked about how science can actually also help with literacy um, one of the things first grade said they absolutely will not need to spend a lot of review which they've had to in the past um, and still continuing our commitment to nonfiction writing and reading and then they love the kindergarten grading rubric which uh, Dave created with our K team want to do something similar. So that's kind of their wish list for working on this year. So um, we, you know, those are all things that would match well with some of the work that we did last year. And I think, uh, next steps, I just want to make sure so you know, in December, electronically, we'll be giving you um, the five-year plans from the articulation teams, also the course proposals and registration guides for you to review and for us to discuss them at the January meeting. So, questions? Love it. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. 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 <laughs> Representatives from the city council 
not all of, but many potential partners, um, River Valley Theater, Scott County, um, the Cultural Liaison, the YMCA, the Senior Club. Um, <coughs> I said River Valley Theater. theater. Um, potential partners, both in programming and financially for this um, vision that Brad has for the city. And essentially at the end of the meeting, uh, we voted and three of the four of us on the committee um, voted to move forward with the feasibility study to see what, <coughs> what can be accomplished. And that would be the of what our commitment would look like, what our timeline would be with moving to the center of the city, um, scoping a lot of decisions that we need to make in terms of deciding what field helps for sports and all more pool or so it's basically just having some professional weighing on what what we want and what we can do. What's the timing of the feasibility study? They will be completing it by Feb end February, end of January. <coughs> so they're trying to gather a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, so and they will be doing a Backing on Angela, the statements that were reviewed at the beginning of the meeting included all the um, uh, document, documented statements from the previous guiding coalition meeting, and they had a nice write up where everybody got to um, kind of see what they had said and, and actually draft written format as well as uh, make um, some comments to them just to make sure that um, Dennis and the team were on the right path. The primary focus of these this group of statements of consultation this time around had everything to do with looking at it from the student, the parent, and the public lens, which can be a completely different perspective. Um, 
because they broke out into table groups and spent a good deal of time uh, coming up with their statements and then bringing it full circle, putting it on the magic clingy board, whatever Dennis calls it, cool. <laughs> <laughs> magic board, magic map. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I'm not prepared at all to, to say that there was any general themes because there was so much content that was put on that wall uh, as they were asked to look at the um, their statements of consultation from three different lenses on four different building designs. I wouldn't say there's anything without having all that in front of me that I could glean uh, a theme with, which was really, really good to see such a diverse group of opinions and perspectives. I really like that. Um, Mayor Tapke was able to stand up during uh, or after uh, Dr. Thompson uh, provided the community survey results and give a little bit of insight towards the topic that, that Matt and Sean were just talking about, which was uh, interesting. And then the group got to go back again and um, provide some more discussion points on the community survey results as well as um, some of the voter information that they were provided from last March's referendum. And again, come back to the magic clingy wall and put those statements up there. Uh, again, same, same position I would take is that there were so many messages uh, that I wouldn't even be comfortable putting out a theme at this point. Um, however, I have no doubt that our friend Crystal is going to get all that information once it's available to us, put on our Education Forward website so that everything is uh, totally transparent and we'll get a chance to see all the great work that we've done. And just to piggyback off what you have said, um, Rod, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, we'll be sending those statements that they did at the meeting again for them to look at them, and that's what we did last meeting, and to make any comments about those. Dennis had written up after the meeting. So we'll be getting their feedback one, one more time electronically before that's finalized. So, um, I'm here tonight to uh, present the final community survey result. You guys have seen the preliminary results, so none of this will be a big shock and awe moment, but um, we will go through those again. Um, the survey closed Friday afternoon online, but we'll still accept those paper copies through tomorrow um, just to make sure we're getting those that maybe through it in the mail on Friday. Um, we had 1932 completed surveys, um, non-scientific survey. We had it on our website since, I believe, October 9th. Does that sound right? Okay. Um, and then the hard copy via the newspaper. I think the newspaper went out October 9th, and then we had it up. Um, and uh, as you guys had mentioned, we'll be used doing a professional telephone survey. Go ahead, Brad. One of the things I want to mention when Talk. We had some discussion at the group about, you know, do, are we going to get into validity or, or those kinds of things about a survey? And what I would say that's most important is that we're, we're throughout this process, we're going to try and bring you all maybe eight, ten pretty pretty important data points. One of those important data points is, is this survey because it actually is taking place before the district has made a decision. So because it's taking place, it gives you a temperature of where the community's at before any kind of what you might call an educational campaign or even a preference. So for this survey, um, it's much like the, the public elections that just happened uh, here last week. You, it's a poll, it's an opinion, it's where is the temperature at. And I shared with the group, um, even when we do the scientific survey, the scientific survey is in that 94, 95% accuracy uh, margin of error. And unfortunately, the last time we have had our uh, professional survey done, and quite frankly, the community survey, they were wrong. So there, we can't just hone in on one set of data is the point. We're going to stack up our 10, 12 pieces of data, and eventually you all will have to weigh each piece of that. So each piece, doesn't uh, mean that we're asking you to hold each piece with the same amount of weight. It's take it for what it's worth. And we had a voice in the community come through, and that's why we're, we're presenting it here as, as a before before you make the decision, where are people at? That's not what we're trying to, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just curious, though. How many did you get via paper and how many online? Predominantly online? Predominant. Do you have a, a couple, couple hundred, hundred, or how many? I would say a hundred. Okay. Mm -hmm. Be a paper, paper, hard paper copy. Um, most were done online. Um, so this is question one. If each of the following options was the only choice on the referendum ballot, how would you vote? Um, blue is I would vote yes, and red is I would vote no. And then people were asked to um, say yes or no to each of the options. So just track those eight benefits to that. Could you go back? It's yeah. kind of interesting. To one of the people at the meeting commented to me, um, 
their belief, and again, this is not scientific, so you can make any assumptions you want to, their belief was with the 1600 student edition, for example, that our election results tracked closely with the 66%, that if we had a 63-ish percent, this was at 66, that it, the, the, the comment that was made that I actually thought was kind of an interesting one is, seems like the community uh, perception might be where it was at back in March or close close to it. Again, not a right or wrong, that was just a, a, a position that they were looking, or a lens they were looking through. And then I broke those numbers down a little bit further. I know the bag coalition people were wanting more some solid numbers, so I thought I could provide you guys with those. That's the breakdown of that numbers. Um, and then I question two, which is your preferred option to solve the enrollment crunch? Um, so the student edition is 43% followed by the second high school. Again, it doesn't add up to 100% because we didn't limit how many pe could people could choose. Um, so it's a little over. You have uh, in front of you the uh, uh, motion to uh, approve the uh, parameters for refunding. I think the important part is, is that that refunding is actually a refunding of an advanced crossover refunding for the, uh, we did that sun path and red over back in 2006 and this can give us a better rate on a current refunding. So, uh, in, in the end, we're looking at trying to uh, save about $800,000 over the next 10 years uh, with this refunding. So uh, that's what the, the bottom line would be, would be the $800,000 uh, according to the according to the doctor. The floor, right? We wouldn't do it if it was under the, under the floor. Any questions? Can I see? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think the uh, uh, Jackson bonds. They were they were they were more to be in there. So.
first one is uh, Michael Holheisel's um, list of activities, description of activities, which uh, starts on Wednesday, February 4th, 2015. Basically, what we're, what we're looking at here are from a uh, legal and financial standpoint, what are the things we have to get in place if, in fact, we wanted to go to election? And one of the options that was proposed is May 5th, so this, uh, Michael drew it up as May 5th. Uh, right now, this is just a kind of a point of information. It's uh, you can see uh, from from this that in January, February, you have to take official action should you choose to go forward with the referendum. And it's all of the legal stuff. It's the design of the ballot question. It's the design of uh, you know everything from review, comment to election day. And I would do, I'm just going to pause. Um, you many of you, I guess all of you, actually have seen this before. Are there any comments or questions on? Um, this this procedure, and then I'll take a look at the survey after that. Any questions at all on that? It kind of follows the same timeline as the last. It does. It changes it by a couple months. Right. So if I were someone watching this, um, the message would be that the school district would have until January, basically, for a first reading of a ballot question. February for a second reading of a ballot question, or a May 5th um, where people would go to the polls. Okay, let's I take- have, I do have a really sure. procedural question. Why is the designation of new polling locations required before we actually have our official vote on the 20th? What's it? Let's act, ask our election <laughs> judge. It's election <laughs> timelines, so it's statute of days. And we, the last thing we did, we sent a mailing indicating what their polling place was. We need to change it. Even if we were changing it back to normal, we'd have to notify them then. So statute days, and then we need to modify it. Okay, any other? So we have to. Right, because we have to. Because we have to. I'm trying to get a yeah. in my head. Sarah, do you have any of the calendars to say when is our second January meeting? When is our mm -hmm. first February second? Because these aren't the meeting days. Mm -hmm. um, January 12th is a reorgan business meeting. Yeah. Um, the 26th is a learning, a learning session. Okay. And then there's a business on February 9th, which we indicated um, as a tentative adoption date for the resolution calling for the election. Um, that, that February 9th is the last day date to take action. Okay, so February 9th is the second reading for right. action. Yes. Right. Yes. And the first reading when in January. If we have a learning session, I suppose we could add a business meeting. We could, we could, and that's just our own procedure yeah. to, to add a first reading, but we could we add it. I would and I would suggest we probably would want to. Yeah, that. that's what I'm getting at is that just so we know what that quasi-drop dead date is for that first reading. You'd need um, a motion on first reading calling the election, right. so that would be the January 12th, okay. and then the learning session in between, and then the February 9th for the second reading. Okay. So we could actually do the learning session with a with a business right. meeting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we have the option of doing it later. The later we give yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you have is the option of a three-hour meeting if you want to yeah. have that be right before yeah. you make your for your final decision on what you want to do. It gives you a chance for the board to meet in a learning session beforehand. Yeah. Should you choose to want to do that. Right. Yeah. Can I ask you to be adding more polling places? I think that's a decision that we would all highly <laughs> advise, yes. And those are details that we have to do, it. we have to figure out. But that was, I'm sure the Guiding Coalition would be happy about that too. The only other thing, not to get too far down in the weeds, is the, you know, there's only two or three uh, survey research companies that are considered the varsity or the team, the real outstanding groups. And um, the, the uh, Peter Leatherman group, the Bill Morris group, is absolutely the, I mean, they're, they're highly respected. In fact, the city of Shakopee will use them uh, for their, their survey, uh, Mark McNeil said, and I value them, and school districts, cities, counties value them. We just had the 5%, 4%, 6% error thing, and I think it would be hard for our community to believe that once, once you've had a, had a failure. So I think that uh, uh, one of the, the things that we talked about from the get-go is, do we go with the odds or do we go with a different company and then we are battling some public perception? And so 
as you can see, what I've, what I've pre presented to you is uh, the national company, this, or the firm, the Center for uh, Community Opinion, is actually a uh, company where, where the um, Brad Senden uh, is a partner, and he's a Minnesota guy, and he's had 25 years plus. Um, you can see the many uh, kinds of works that he's done, proposals he's had. Uh, the, uh, you can go through the document here, and it looks at the survey research design, all of the uh, things that get you down in the weeds, but you're going to need to know. Um, and then it'll, uh, once we get the approval to, to accept the process, then uh, Brad and his team are ready to go, which means that we would get some template questions that uh, other communities have been successful with and have used. We would get together and work on a, a survey. And remember, this is telephone again and then ask the kind of questions that we need to know scientifically to help us determine one more set of data. And again, that survey isn't the end all either. We've, we've learned that, that what they say is 94, 95% accurate, but once in a while, it's not the end all. So we have to use that as a piece of data. And that can actually happen um, before uh, December 8th. I think they would start closely there after Thanksgiving, and then they would be able to complete it because they have a large enough bank, they'd be able to complete the, the, the sampling and get the results so that the night that of our next board meeting, is that the 16th, Sarah? Mm -hmm. uh, the 16th, and uh, we adjusted <coughs> that because this, uh, Brad would come in and would personally present the findings. That way it gives you all the chance. And, and as special guests at your board meeting, we've asked the Guiding Coalition to have a joint meeting. So all of that first-hand data and that report and the findings will come back that evening. And so um, we, we are preparing and would like to move forward and with the acceptance of the timeline and, and the process, we'll, we would get going on that right away. So I'd open up to any questions, comments uh, that you might have. How, what's the process for getting So uh, we'll get the templates and the samples. We'll, we'll be able to work with you all to make sure that the themes and the questions actually match up to what we want. We'll vet it, we'll filter it, we'll send it back to him, back, forth, back, forth. Once we give them the, we're good to go, then they'll, then they'll get into their bank of uh, folks that do the telephone, telephone survey. So we have the final say, it's our survey. When you say we, you mean? School board. Ron, I would simply yeah. say that I commend you and the administration for taking a step back and, and uh, probably taking one obstacle out of our path and not going back to the same place before we had some issues. I know that wasn't an easy decision, but they, they are practical. But I think it's wise in this case. I don't know that. Yeah, if we could get a motion to accept and approve this, uh, Sarah and I and my uh, admin team will get going with the first shot at, um, at this, and then uh, we'll also get started with a pretty extensive Gantt chart, which would include some of those uh, school board things that you'd like to see in a timeline, and I know many of you appreciate that. So we'll get some benchmarks and critical timeline uh, things going for you as well for the next time we get together. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yes, and, um, you know, this is one of the things that, uh, and when, with American Education Week, one of the things that uh, we can do to help honor folks is to bring forward the, um, uh, the resolution that honors and recognize, recognizes all staff. And so I, I'm not sure if we want to read the resolution or if we want to, the spirit of the resolution speaks to all staff in our district. Sometimes it's written in a way that just identifies teachers and we've come to know that we celebrate anyone who has a positive experience with, with students. And so I would offer up that if you want to, in the spirit of the resolution, if we could, uh, if we could uh, accept that, I would, uh, I would appreciate it. Is there someone that would like to read it or just would like to make a motion to accept it? I'll make a motion to Is there a second? 
just once again that this is about all of all people, volunteers, uh, community members, anyone who makes a significant difference in, in our students' lives. And this is, this is an important week, 17th through the 21st. And if you get the chance, please thank the staff member um, on your behalf. Who signs the resolution? Mary Wood. If you all would like to, we've done that before too. I think it would be kind of cool, but I also think it would be nice if you were there. Can I volunteer you? Oh, I have a very limited voice tonight. Oh, well, you're, you can delegate to the person. You can do dramatic intercourse. I want to be like that. I'm prepared. It's in the. All right. Whereas American Education Week was first observed in December 1921 as an opportunity to focus public support on our nation's schools, and whereas the strength of our nation depends upon its citizenry that values our public schools and supports our children's education, and whereas all staff in the district provide a safe, healthy, and nourishing learning environment for our children and communities, and whereas schools bring together adults and children, educators and volunteers, business leaders, and elected officials in common enterprise. Now, therefore, be resolved, the School Board of the Shakopee Public Schools hereby designates November 17 to 21, 2014, as American Education Week in the Shakopee Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. We don't have a motion yet to accept that. Yeah, yeah, okay, we did, so you just added the. No, I'll second. I'll second. Did you second? You're third. I'll third. You're third. Yeah. We're good. Covered. We really did. read it. <laughs> For the discussion, just a quick lower head. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, thank you very much. We'll go to other. Anything? The only thing I would bring up under other is let's take a quick look at the other up, uh, upcoming meetings and important dates. November 24th, we have our board retreat. December 8th is the truth and taxation hearing. And remember that. That might just, if we had a quorum of the board, uh, typically a truth and taxation hearing uh, is held on a normal board meeting, but because we moved that board meeting, we're actually now doing that meeting on the 16th, but um, statements went out to the public saying that December 8th was truth and taxation date. So uh, we'll try and get a quorum, we will get a quorum for that night, and then Mike and I will be there um, to join our guests. And then December 16th is the joint meeting of the Guiding Coalition School Board. I talked about that before. And then there will likely be some other business things we have to do. So we'll have at the end of that time, we'll do a very short uh, business meeting uh, to follow. We talked about January 12th a bit. That's our reorg meeting. Uh, there will also be a business meeting follow the, the annual reorganization. We have a board learning session on the 26th. Maybe uh, Sarah will, will check with the board and see if we want to uh, had a, a business meeting, a short business meeting on there. February 9th, business uh, meeting, and that's the resolution where we do call for a special election should you decide to do that. And then May 5th uh, is what I'm, uh, Guiding Coalition talked about May 5th, May 12th, you know, what, what do you want to do? Um, right now I'm just proposing that that might be the potential special election, but certainly other options uh, are available. Yes. <laughs> I was trying to have you save your voice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Angela, do you want to add anything? Mm -hmm.